Today is January 28, 2017, and as always, let's ask our Heavenly Family to guide us. Heavenly Family, Toda Lakal, thank you for everything. Thank you for love, thank you for truth, thank you for each other. We're really grateful for the opportunity to once again consider the message that you've given us. So please guide us in our discussion tonight. Help us to understand the truth better now than we ever have. Let your name be glorified. Toda. We ask this, B'Shem Tzemach, in the name of Branch. Amen. Amen. All right, well, um, of course, we're continuing on with questions and answers like we were doing last night, and hopefully you guys have had some more time, or hopefully you've taken the time to think of more questions that you might have and that sort of thing. Again, our focus is questions which either are a particular uh, struggle for someone or deal with the foundation of the message in some way or are on some fundamental or important thing one way or or the other um, rather than just kind of minor points here and there. So with that said, would anyone like to start with a question? Uh, yes, I have and I'm trying to formulate the question. Um, I hold this message in all messages that I've come across from my heavenly family as very precious. Um, but I... Um, I haven't in no way been able to investigate every aspect of all the messages that I have come across. So I guess my question is, investigate in regard to the absolute truth. Um... The things that I've not been able to investigate um, how do I reflect or how do i how should I feel about uh, things that I believe in, but I haven't been able to prove them, and I don't know that I'll have enough time in my life to be able to uh, accomplish that. I don't know that I have the the intellect uh, to uh, to do. I understand the principles, but I, you know, I it you have to put them in practice in order for them to be fluent, in order for them to have a natural flow from within our our own thinking. So. When uh, this type of investigation is new to me, so this opens up a whole gamut of wow. So about the things I can't prove beyond the doubt, how do how do how do we feel about them? I feel what I'm saying is is what if I think it's the voice of Christ then I believe. But I can't necessarily teach that aspect or to investigate it. Do you, do you uh, have a sense of where I'm coming from? Absolutely, yeah. And I think that it's an extremely good and important question. And I think it's one that we can all relate to in some way because 
there is so much to the message and so much to life that, you know, how do we possibly investigate every single aspect of everything and, um, you know, to the point of, you know, to the point that's really needed to have genuine knowledge or to be able to share it with someone else and, and that sort of thing. Um, so there is, a, there is a whole lot. First, <laughs> you know, I just want to recognize that fact that there is a whole, a whole lot to it, so much that, um, you know, I, I don't think that I will in this life be able to read every single thing that Ellen White wrote just, that's just dealing with her writings. Um, there's just a lot there. Um, I could read all of the claimed ancient scriptures, um, and then there will still be more that will be discovered. And there may be some that are unavailable to me, and, and then reading them once is one thing, but really becoming thoroughly acquainted with them is another. And doing this with absolutely everything and having time for other other investigations may not be possible. Um, and, and the fact is, hey, none of us know exactly when we're going to die, and it's hard to say how long we're, we're going to live, and it may just happen that we don't have enough time to investigate absolutely everything. Um, so that's certainly the case for all of us to varying degrees. But the question that you ask highlights a, a principle, and I like how it, you know, acknowledges the fact that, hey, we can't possibly become as thoroughly acquainted with everything as we would like here and now. So what do we do with it? What do we do with the aspects of things that we cannot um, become as thoroughly acquainted with? Um, at first, I want to mention that what we should do is find out what the most important things for us to be thoroughly acquainted with are, and then thoroughly acquaint ourselves with those things. And it may just so be that doing so will thoroughly acquaint us with more than what we, we realized, because ultimately this comes down to principle. This is, understanding principle is, in a sense, a shortcut, if, if we can use such a common term for such a sacred thing. Um, and what I mean by that is, you, if you understand the principle of something, it will help you a long way to know how it applies and the truth of all these various things without having to get into particulars. So I'll just take materialism. And if, if one really understands materialism and the principles involved and the implications of it, which is all wrapped up in understanding the principle, if one really gets that principle, then one will easily be able to recognize anything which is immaterialistic when it's presented to them without having to get into all these different aspects of things and study the issue as thoroughly as they might need to otherwise just because they understand the principle of materialism. So it just it makes it a lot um, easier and less time-consuming just understanding the principle. But I know that that's not the aspect you're touching on in terms of just investigating everything out there, you're talking just even in terms of the message. But I wanted to bring that up just for the principle that understanding principles help us in, uh, in dealing with what we don't know and what we do know. And it helps us to come to conclusions without needing to spend so much time on a particular subject as we might have to otherwise. Um, so when it comes to the message, you know, what we've learned in this message, you know, we've, we've dealt with 
coming to knowledge and the difference between knowledge and belief and when it is justified to believe something and when it is not. And what we've learned is that if we do not know something, we should not believe that thing. Because someone can believe something without knowledge and you, anyone can believe anything without knowledge. So what makes a belief justified is when knowledge is present. But the, one of the expressions that you used is to prove something beyond a doubt. And here's the thing. No one can ever prove anything beyond a doubt. So if what someone means by knowledge is being so thoroughly convinced that there is absolutely no possible doubt, then that is a knowledge that no one will ever have. Because it is possible to doubt anything at any time. It will be possible forever to doubt everything any time. I mean, we can even doubt our own existence if we want. It doesn't mean that it's justified to doubt our existence or that we have a good reason to doubt our existence. But we could. Uh, my reason for mentioning that is simply that knowledge is, is not an absolute knowing. It's not absolutely, uh, it's not an absolute certainty concerning something. Rather, knowledge is an awareness of something to be a fact. It's something as being true. And that awareness is brought about by experimentation, which points to a certain conclusion. So it's the weight of evidence which, uh, which really determines what is justified to believe and what is not. Just wanted to mention, there's a line that is not on mute and there's some background noise coming through. So for anyone who is not speaking, if you could uh, either hit the mute button on your phone or star six, and then you can do the same thing to come off mute. Thanks. So knowing things really comes down to the weight of evidence. It doesn't come down to proving something in the sense of passing something to the place of beyond the possibility of doubt because nothing can ever be there. It's not possible to have something that is actually, like, absolutely beyond the potential for any doubt at all. It's just beyond reasonable doubt. So I mention that because it's important to distinguish for the sake of your question between knowledge as being awareness of truths because of evidence and the inability to doubt. Because if we need to study something to the point where it's impossible to doubt it, we will never get beyond the first thing because it will always be possible. The possibility to doubt has nothing to do with how true or untrue something is or how much evidence or lack of evidence there is for that thing. It just simply has to do with the fact that we, in our own minds, can choose to doubt. So what do we do with the things then that we don't have evidence for? Well, if we don't have evidence for something, we actually don't know it, and thus we are not justified in believing it. And this can be a difficult thing. It can. But what we should do is we should say, okay, what are the things that I don't actually have evidence for that I believe that are very, very important and that I'm living my life by and, and all of that? And we should make those things a point of serious investigation to find out, do we have 
a basis for this, or am I just blindly believing this? And there, you know, there are things that are of less consequence as compared to other things. So, you know, someone may, for example, uh, not have thoroughly investigated. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, let's just say someone has not thoroughly investigated the books of First and Second Chronicles to see if they are a product of inspiration. And I myself haven't done that. Well, that is of less consequence than, say, whether Jesus rose from the dead or not. You know, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead versus if he did, that question makes a huge difference in our overall perspective on the world. If First and Second Chronicles are a product of inspiration or not, it doesn't make that big of a difference. Not to say that it's totally inconsequential, but certainly nothing near the question of the resurrection of Jesus or, say, the existence of our heavenly family or, you know, is the current message that we are proclaiming actually true or not. You know, these are big questions, and these are the ones that if someone does not actually have knowledge on, that they should make a serious point of investigation in order to gain knowledge. So they should do a variety of careful experiments in order to gain knowledge on those points. And if they gain knowledge on those points, like if someone can really determine oh, Jesus really did rise from the dead. Yes, our heavenly family really does exist. The current message is actually true. You know, if someone can determine those things, that really sets a direction for life. And then what they would have to do with the other things, which perhaps they haven't investigated thoroughly yet, is simply say, hey, you know, I don't know on that. And since I don't know... I don't have a belief on it one way or the other. So, like, I'll just use the same example that I mentioned, First and Second Chronicles. I have not investigated the question as to whether they are a product of inspiration. I'm unaware of any claim to being a product of inspiration. And I, I have not done the experiments to find out if they are or are not. And since I have not actually done any experiments, I have no genuine knowledge, and I would not be justified in believing one thing or another in regard to that question. So, yes. I, I can imagine someone listening to this and thinking, what do you mean you're not aware of any claim that they're inspired? They're in the Bible. Of course there's a claim that they're inspired. But what we mean by that is, in the writings, First and Second Chronicles, if you were to sit down and read those independent of any other compilation or thinking that they're in what we call the Bible, is there anything in those writings that claim that they're being written under inspiration? And that's what you mean. Right. What I mean is an internal claim from the writings themselves rather than other people claiming that it is inspired. So that's a very important distinction. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, basically, the, the straightforward answer is that that which we have investigated and actually gained knowledge on, those are the things which we should claim positions on and we should claim knowledge and thus have belief in the conclusions that we have arrived at through investigation. The things that we have not investigated, we can simply say, I haven't investigated that. I don't have any genuine knowledge on it, and therefore I don't uh, basically place a belief in regard to that point because I simply don't know. 
And that's honest, it's straightforward, it's fair. And we shouldn't be afraid of that. I, I know that the, the place where people might be more fearful in regard to that is if it's something that's a big thing in their life, like a big question that they're living by that they have not investigated, and then they have to acknowledge, oh man, I don't have knowledge on this, therefore I shouldn't believe something in regard to this. And then that's an identity issue with people. But I don't think that that's a bad thing. I just recommend that if it is a big serious thing that you make it a serious point of investigation. So focus on the big issues first. And as you settle the big issues, that will guide you and, and show you which issues should next be investigated. The other thing that I want to mention is that there are different sorts of investigations that can be done. And some of them are direct, some of them are indirect, but we can still determine conclusions based on those experiments. And the other thing that I want to say is that kind of the way that I've been talking about it so far with, well, we can say that we simply don't know or know, that's, that's true, but there's another aspect to it that we can mention, and that's probability. It's not that everything is just confined to the realm of we know or we don't know. Now, everything is either we know or we don't know, but let's say... If we, if we don't know something, it doesn't mean that we don't have any sort of assessment of the probability of it being true or not. So let's say someone comes to me and they make a claim about some sort of health issue. And I have not looked into the health issue one way or the other. I therefore do not have any knowledge one way or the other in regard to that issue and I should not form a belief about that issue because I don't have any knowledge and therefore my belief would be not justified. That said, I may be able to say, well, it sounds improbable or unlikely that what they're saying is true. If, for instance, it is a, a claim aspects of reality which can be determined to be true. But if I haven't looked into it, I still can't say I know, but I can say that sounds improbable. It is an extraordinary claim because it seems to conflict with other verifiable information. So it would require a lot of evidence to demonstrate. Therefore, it seems unlikely or you might have something that seems likely because, let's say, it's in harmony with what has so far been determined to be the case and seems to make sense. So you say, oh, well, you know, that I, even though I don't know and therefore I do not form a belief about that issue, I could see that being the case. You know, it sounds likely or probable or at least 50-50 or whatever. You know, there's different degrees of probability. And so that's uh, just another aspect to this that it's not so just, oh, I don't know, and that's it, and no, no manner of assessment at all. It's just that it's not right to form beliefs and claim knowledge on something which we don't actually know. But we can assess probability given our current information, and if we state it in that way and form it in that way in our minds, then it's honest and straightforward and saying, hey, with the current information I have, this seems probable or improbable. Um, always being open to more information and acknowledging if we haven't looked at it thoroughly or done experiments that we really don't know and we need to be open to whatever. So does that help to answer your question?
Yes, it does. Um, I just wanted to, uh, I was just thinking that also I find times that I, um, and I'm sorry that it, maybe it's more my issue than a general issue with everybody, but I feel like um, I'm not qualified to do some of these experiments. Um, let's say somebody lays out a viewpoint on a an aspect that is very, very convincing. But in reality, it's not true. Would I be able to distinguish? Would I have the the intellect and capacity to see through the deception? So sometimes my thoughts recently have been that I don't have any business investigating that right now. I need to stay on concrete. What I know and then maybe dig into that at a later time. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Totally. And there are certainly things which I would love to investigate, but I recognize that I do not have the pieces in place to investigate something. I don't even know how to conduct the right experiment in regard to certain things, like, you know, things in quantum physics and string theory and different science things. Just just to give an example that's, like, really obvious, like, yeah, I'm nowhere near being able to even assess that. And so at this point, you know, that's not the most important issue for me, and I'm not equipped to be able to investigate that, so I'm going to focus on the things that are more important and um, realistic at the present time for me to investigate. And again, that's, that's an issue that doesn't have a you know, immediate consequence for my actual life. I mean, whether some physics theory is true or not doesn't change how I'm, I'm really going about living day to day and all of that. Um, if there's an issue that someone feels unqualified to address, but it is an issue that they're living their life by or that dramatically affects their life in some way, then what I would encourage anyone in that position to do is to find out, well, what can I do? What steps can I take in order to be able to address this issue? Because if I'm living my life by something and I don't actually know or I haven't investigated and I feel unqualified to, well, then that's a good time for the person to say, you know, I'm going to become qualified to investigate this because it's such a big issue for my life. And so that's that's what I would, uh, you know, recommend for anyone in that place. And the other thing is that while we are all unqualified in regard to many, many things and simply unprepared to investigate certain things because we don't have the prerequisite knowledge, um, that's not the case for many of these big issues. Our own present insufficiency doesn't mean that we can't be equipped. You know, there are certain things that I can investigate now and do experiments on, which I couldn't a year ago. And it's not that I had to, you know, become a, a more intelligent being or, or anything like that. I just had to learn a few things. And that's, that's what we can all do. We can constantly advance, constantly learn more. And as we learn more, we will be better able 
to conduct right experiments. And um, so that's what we ought to do. Yes, acknowledge that there are things that we can't test. You know, for any of us, there are things that none of us can really test right now. And it's okay to be in that place. You know, it's okay not to be able to test absolutely everything. It's just we shouldn't form beliefs about things upon which we cannot test or things which we cannot test. Um, but I also have to urge everyone to advance in, in your abilities and in and your, your knowledge so that your range of subjects which you can investigate rightly is constantly expanding. So I hope that that's helpful and, and makes sense and everything. Was there anything else in mind, Gary? Yes, I uh, I agree. I have to, uh, and I pray for Holy Spirit to lead me in a um, in a path that that is uh, tailored to my understanding. Um, because I'm here, and uh, I'm and I'm in. I'm here in this message. I um, I don't know that I can explain. Um, in other words, I didn't exhaust Seventh Day Adventist SDA regular SDA. Uh, I didn't exhaust Ellen White to where I. Well, I've exhausted that, and, and then I had to research Victor Hada, and so on and so forth. I haven't. I haven't exhausted a basic Bible. You know, uh, there's so much to learn. And, and so I'm here, um, in a sense, ahead of myself. Um, but I feel, and, I, and that's a dangerous thing, I guess. But i got to be honest. Uh, I feel a need to be here. And I say that with Yeah, I'm shaking. I feel a need to hear what the Heavenly Family has to say. And I'm so thankful that the Heavenly Family has patience. to hear me out and to love me. And I can't explain Amen. it. There. I can't explain. I can't put together a presentation to explain why the Heavenly Family loves me. I can't do it right now. Anyway, I believe there will be a time when I will comprehend Everything I the family is trying to convey to me, but I feel there's a need to make sure that I'm I'm holding on, and I never let go. I never want to be swindled out of the connection that I have with my family. That's all I want to say. Amen. And, you know, I just want to comment a little bit more on that, how it's reasonable if one is going through life and has come across many things, that, you know, and none of us have exhausted, you know, the various steps that have brought us to here, you know. There's just so much each step of the way. And it wouldn't have been right for us to attempt to exhaust it before taking the next step because... It can't be done, you know. We cannot exhaust what has come before. It's inexhaustible, really. 
And so there's just, you know, we, we, can't, we can't do it. And so it would be so wrong to reject present truth because of not being as fully acquainted with the past as, as we might. Um, so, I, you know, I, th- I think that that's a good way to go about things. And, you know, one, one of the things about this is that it is reasonable to say, hey, you know what? Like, you feel the need to be here. You recognize that there's something here for you. And probably one of the reasons is that simply in life and in hearing different things and, you know, so on and so forth, this so far just makes the most sense, you know? And that is sufficient for someone to say, hey, this is the thing that makes the most sense that I've heard. So I'm going to press forward with it and prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good, you know? So if something makes the most sense, well, that's an indication of where to, where to be, what to investigate, and all of that. And, um, you know, so I, I encourage you guys to look at the message and to hear, hear the message. And, you know, I, I think that anyone who's been here for any length of time can say, hey, you know, this actually does make a lot of sense. And the principles, the, the idea of truth and love and righteousness and being changed from one who is selfish and sins to one who is loving and does not sin, all of that makes sense. And we can recognize, at least in theory, that it's the answer. And so I think that there's more than enough for anyone to say, hey, you know what? this is something to really pay attention to. And then as you move forward, yeah, do the experiments on the big issues first. And when we, when we do those experiments and learn more and more about it in regard to these big issues, you know, we, we can. And it's not necessarily that it has to be a formal presentation or, or anything like that, you know, as to the love of our Heavenly Family and, and these sorts of things. But we can call forth the evidences for their love. I know they love me because this and this and this. And we can share that with others. And, you know, all people have different, different callings, different ways of, of going about doing things. And, um, and that's totally fine, you know. Some people may never give, you know, a a study, as it were, laying out the evidences for the crucifixion and the resurrection and the truth of the message and, and this and that. We should acquaint ourselves with the evidence, for sure. But it's not necessarily the case that everyone is called to lay things out in the exact same way or to have a a very intricate um, understanding and manner of presentation and all that. For some, it may be that they can, they can get it and they can sing songs praising our Heavenly Family and testifying to what our Heavenly Family has done in their life. You know? So... There's a, a huge variety of, of people in this world and our Heavenly Family intends to do a huge variety of things with each individual. Um, it is important for us to all understand the same principles and to live by the principles of love and truth. And that's the foundation. And that's what our Heavenly Family is emphasizing to us through all of our different studies. But if we get those, those main principles and live by them, then as much as what we do may be different from other individuals, we will work together in harmony, and it will all be a grand symphony honoring our Heavenly Family. Amen. 
and amen, and I thank my heavenly family, and I love my precious Savior, wisdom, my heavenly Father, and my heavenly Mother. Amen. Amen. So does anyone else have a question? Uh, yeah, it's regarding how to investigate a message. Um, uh, my question is, okay, so I'm studying the message about wisdom is a female and Holy Spirit is a female. And um, but the sources that I study is from French. So uh, would it be bias? Um, okay, um, I just want to make sure because like the information is from you guys, and even though I read the scriptures, I agree. I read the apography, I agree, and um, some scholar information about uh, females in the fourth century, uh, before and after. And um, and I experience it. I pray. I feel the wisdom, and um, I well, you know, maybe that is then. I got all this information, and um, and then I tell someone, "Hey, I this is what I learned, and I saw this all the information to the person." But then would the person say, well, all this information that you find out you study is from the branch. So this is bias. So my argument is that even though you think it's bias, but I'm able to prove it to you through the scripture, through the apography, through the scholar and experience. So I don't think I'm being biased. <laughs> Can I say that? Or is, it a, is this a critical thinking? That's a really good question. Uh, so first thing that I want to say is that it doesn't matter who the information comes from or where it comes from. All that matters is whether it's true or not. And so just because something comes from the branch or from some other source or anything like that, if it's commenting on something else, like it, it basically comes down to each individual claim. So if you open up one of Lois Roden's writings and she mentions how you know, a certain writing, let's say the Gospel according to the Hebrews, has the Holy Spirit described as the mother of Jesus. Well, whether Lois Roden said that or, or whether someone in a Catholic church said that, or a Jewish person said that, or whatever, it doesn't make any difference. It's either true or it's not true. And even, you know, the scriptures themselves are only a witness. You know, Jesus said, these are they which testify of me. Actually, what he said before that is, you search the scriptures, for in them... You think you have life, but these are they which testify of me. Which is to say that they were just pointing to him. You know, it wasn't like they were the the source of life in themselves or, or anything like that. And it's the same thing with the branch message. It's it's pointing you to truth, it's pointing you to information, and if it's true, it's just simply true. And so it's, it, there's no inherent bias in something just because you learn it through a certain source. And if someone was going to say that, the problem is you can say that about anything. Another aspect is that if all someone means by saying bias is that it has a certain perspective, well, then everything has a certain perspective. You know, everything is coming from a certain point of view. 
and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Um, but if they mean by bias that it is twisting information to fit that perspective, then I would say that that's absolutely not the case. And the test for that really comes down to the individual claims. So, you know, I, from the way you, you're describing things, it doesn't sound like you're going about it in a biased way. Um, sounds like you're investigating things, you're reading the literature, but, you know, the branch doesn't just make claims. The branch points people to places where they can verify those claims and provides information to evidence those claims. And people can test it. People can go and check it out. And if it's true, it's true. If it's false, it's false. You know, that's uh, one of the things that's wonderful about this message is that it equips people with the tools necessary to test it so that they don't have to take my word for it or someone else's word for it. They can study it out and find out, is this really true? Is this not really true? And they have the, the means to do so. You know, we, we put you guys in contact with information. You know, look at the resources page on the, the new website, for instance. Well, there's a, a lot there that people can look at in order to test what the claims of the message are. And, um, Give the website, please. Yeah, bdsda.com. And Thank for you. this page, it's uh, with, you know, again, bdsda.com forward slash resources. So that's, you know, all part of the message. And those resources are not branch resources either. They're resources from other people. And there are certain topics. I mean, you read Lois Roden's writings. One of the things that she was trying to do was to show look, this isn't just our perspective. This is something that is acknowledged by people of many, many different belief systems. And, you know, you look at some of Lois Roden's writings and she quotes from Jews, Muslims, Christians, whether Catholic, Protestant, Mormon, um, whatever. You know, she's quoting from all sorts of sources to show how, look, these facts that we're talking about are not a particular bias perspective from one little group in Texas. These are things that are acknowledged by a whole bunch of people who are professionals in the relevant fields and who acknowledge these things. And, and you can verify it regardless of your faith. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Heavenly Family. Mm -hmm. So, any other questions? I have one, too. But I'll let someone go first. Okay, sure. So if anyone else has one before uh, Rachel's question, you got 10 seconds. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Rachel. Okay, I may need you help me formulate my question and rephrase it. Um, I understand that we are not called to be full-time ministry, and we don't have to sell our houses and be poor to be branch candidate um, because we are we have different. We have different job duties. We can, in our field, we can do different things. 
uh, to ex- to bring the ministry in our field. Um, but I think in the past we also learned that once we learn more the message, and people will working less hours and studying God's word or doing God's work more and more. Um, so my question is, eventually, all the people, basically we are supposed to become full-time and selling our houses and be poor. Well, I mean, not have to be poor, but, but I hope you mean, you know, extreme idea. Um, you, you know what I mean? <laughs> and um, is that the differences between born again or not born again, giving yourself and not giving yourself? And um, so that's why I'm a little confused. Um, can you replace it if you understand my question? Sure. So how I understand your question is that you're, you're expressing how you've understood different parts of the message. So one thing is that, you know, we, we've said that not everyone is supposed to just quit their jobs and be full-time ministers. You know, at least the message doesn't require everyone to quit their jobs and go full-time teaching the Word or sell your house and be poor and, and all of that. That's not a requirement of the message. Um, there may be some in the message who are called to quit their job and go full-time into ministry and all of that. And certainly that should be the case, but it's not, uh, it's not ever required that everyone will do that. However, we have this other aspect that we've talked about that as the message progresses and as people learn more and more, they will work for God more and more and work for the world less and less. And so does that mean that it will eventually come to the point where we kind of all, uh, you know, forsake our our regular jobs and and sell our houses and so on and um, you know but is it you know in being poor how extreme are we going in that how should we go in that and um, kind of how does all that fit together I, I don't know if I'm phrasing your question as as good as it could be phrased but is that kind of what you're asking yeah um, and one more thing too so at the end, the person that will give up everything that will be more likely born again than the first part, not giving up everything. So eventually, the one that giving up everything will be the um, will be born again and uh, being a full time ministry. Okay, right. So that's the other aspect that. Uh, is it that those who do give up everything and their jobs and houses and all of that will be born again and more likely more more likely to be born again and those who don't won't okay so those are good questions um so the first thing i want to mention is that someone having a a job as a full-time minister teaching the message full time is a specific calling that not everyone is to have. Even in the kingdom, in the land of Israel, throughout the ages of eternity, you know, there will be some who will be called to be teaching and there will be others who are not. In the premillennial kingdom, there will be a need for carpenters. There will be a need for engineers, for farmers, for bankers, for doctors and dietitians and artists and you know all these different things. There's a need for all of that. And 
being a full-time teacher is just one of those things that's needed. And so it will never be the case that everyone in the message is going to be called to be a full-time teacher. People have different talents, and it's all needed. If everyone was a full-time teacher, we wouldn't have the other things that are needed in life. You know, we need food, we need buildings, we need all these other things. So it, there won't come a time where everyone will be called to do that. People also need houses. Um, there may come a time where individuals have to sell their current houses and get another house. Um, one of the principles involved with that is country living, how we should move away from the cities and go into the countries. And different people in different areas might have to go further out or not as far out, depending on where you live and the different conditions and, and so on. And someone just has to be praying about that to find out from our Heavenly Family where they should go when and and all that sort of thing. Um, in terms of as the message progresses, people devoting more and more time to the work of our Heavenly Family and less and less time to their their own worldly businesses and, and that sort of thing. What we mean by that is that individuals should constantly be developing their talents and as time goes on, they should seek more and more and more to use those talents for the things of our Heavenly Family. So if someone is... Um, let's say they are an artist and they they paint a lot. And let's say they didn't know the message and they're painting and they're they're doing all these things for the sake of their own skill and promoting themselves and becoming a a, a rich person and, and all of that. Well, if they start studying the message and they learn that it is true and they want to promote it, well, now maybe, well, now what they will end up doing, really, is they'll end up using that talent to promote the message. So they will paint things that illustrate the truth in some way. And instead of taking the money and using it for, you know, buying themselves all these luxurious things and so on, they'll use it to forward the gospel. And so that's, that's the way it can happen. And that can happen for, for any type of, um, you know, skill or talent. So th it's not saying that the painter must give up painting and become a teacher. Then maybe some painters will become teachers and still do both, potentially. But there may be some painters who will just go from painting for the sake of themselves to painting for the sake of our Heavenly Family. And they will devote their time to that. And so, you know, that's, that's how, how this can happen. So to kind of recap that and to give a big picture, the way that it is is that all of us are called to do things for our Heavenly Family. Some are called to be teachers. Some are called to be painters. Some are called to be farmers. Some are called to be whatever. All these different things. And as we learn the message, we should give up the things of the world in that we should give up putting our energies and our time and our talents into promoting ourselves and into promoting the world, we should, we should stop doing that and we should move our energies and our talents and our skills and our money and our everything. We should move ourselves for the sake of saving the world. And as we do that, then we will 
we don't give up our talents. We don't give up all of that. We just use them differently. And for some people, that will entail giving up a house or giving up a car or whatever. And if people are living extravagantly, then people should cease to live extravagantly. It doesn't mean that someone has to live um, in such a way where they have no means at all and, and, and all of that. It doesn't mean that everyone has to become homeless or anything. But if someone's living extravagantly, then they should simply stop doing that and, and live in a way where they are using their resources to help others rather than for self-gratification. So that's just a, a simple principle that anyone in the world should be able to understand, that it's not good to be selfish. We should try to help people in every way that we can. And um, it doesn't mean that they have to change how they do things so that they don't make any money or anything like that. It's just that it's, it's all about how we use our talents how we use our talents, and are we going to use it for selfishness and for worldly gain, or are we going to use it to save souls? And that's ultimately what it comes down to. Does it make a person more or less likely for justification? Right. In terms of justification, it's not just those who become full-time teachers who will be justified or be more likely to be justified. However, if someone devotes their time and their energy to working for the world and for having selfish gain and things like that, they won't be born again while they're doing that. If someone says, you know what, I'm going to do everything I can for the sake of the gospel, and hey, if someone can do that and keep their job, then that's fine. Like if they have a job that ends up um, being very conducive to working for the salvation of mankind, then they don't necessarily have to give that up. Um, but they should be looking for things. Everyone should be looking for a way to use their energies for the sake of saving souls. And those who do that will be those who are certainly more likely to be justified. If you devote your life to saving souls, that's how you will win your crown. That's how Christ won his crown, by devoting himself for the benefit of others rather than for anything selfish. So that's what we ought to do. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, but why... What would you say um, if we are called to be a priest, to minister, to teach people the gospel, then it sounds like we are all called to be a teacher. What do you think about that? So this is something very interesting. There are a few different elements to this. Okay, ancient Israel they were called a nation of priests and kings. Repeat her question. Oh, sure. Thank you. Okay, so the question is, well, we're called to be priests, and so that kind of sounds like we're all called to be full-time ministers. So what do we do with that? Okay, so there are a couple different elements to this. So first thing is that ancient Israel was called a nation of priests and kings. Well, that's being ministers. A priest is someone who, who ministers to others and so on. So there, there are supposed to be a whole nation of priests and kings. And that was back in the Exodus movement that they were called to do that. Yet, at the same time, it was specified that the children of Aaron are to be the priests and that no one else is permitted to do the priestly activity. No one else was permitted to do that. So that's rather interesting. Why is that? I thought everyone is supposed to be a priest. Well, it's using the word priest in two different ways. There's the general idea of being a priest, of just serving others, ministering to others, 
And that can be done in many, many ways. And then there's being a designated priest, being priests who are called to be full-time doing priestly rituals and to be part of that actual system that we typically think of as the priestly system. And that, again, in ancient time, that was just for the children of Aaron. And even among the descendants of Aaron, it had to be people who met other qualifications. And those are recorded in Leviticus 22. So priests were were selected from among a specific group, and only they who were anointed as priests and all of that could end up being those full-time priests. So in the antitypical system, it works in the same way. Everyone is to be a priest in the general sense, that being that everyone is to move forward serving others and ministering to others rather than ministering to themselves. In that general sense, everyone is supposed to be a priest. But those who end up being full-time priests, who are designated priests, anointed priests, those are only a specific group of people. And the Melchizedek priesthood has specifications for who those people can be and who they cannot be. And so those, that's, uh, it's the same way that it worked in the type. You have the general priest, and then you have the specified anointed priests. And just so today, you have the general priest that all of us are supposed to be, and then there are those who are anointed to be priests full-time and who do the work of the sanctuary full-time. Does that answer your question? Oh, yeah. So one is to serve other. The other one is to... um, is, is to do priest rituals. (laughs) <laughs> right. So in the in the Aaronic priesthood, the priesthood of Aaron, that's what the priests would do. They would spend their time doing these rituals. And in the antitype, the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek and also the priesthood of Melchizedek, the time is to be spent doing the things which the Levitical rituals pointed forward to and we still have a lot to understand in regard to that but it has a lot to do with teaching the word it has a lot to do with directly being involved with bringing people to salvation so that's the the work of a a full-time minister okay so now we had the most high priest and we had a prophet and where are the priests? The can- branch candidate? Are they the priests? How come we don't have a priest, actually? So the, the priests in the antitype... Well, right now, I'll, I'll put it like this. Branch candidates are those who are seeking to hopefully be priests. So those who end up being the wave chief will actually be priests they will actually, and here's the thing, this is what, uh, you know, the Silver Trumpet Volume 1, Numbers 3 and 4, for example, this is what they go through, especially Number 3, talking about the rituals to become a priest, but also that includes the priestly garments, which is the Silver Trumpet Volume 1, Number 4. And those types show us that there are certain things required in order for someone to actually be anointed as a priest. And in the the priestly system, after the order of Melchizedek, and in the Melchizedek system, someone must be born again to be a priest. Everyone else should be born again too, but that's one of the requirements for someone to be a priest, is they must be born again. And priest, in this sense, you mean the ones that do the 
antitypical ritual that the Levitical priesthood did. Yes. yes. To be anointed as a priest, to be in that role, someone must be born again. Okay, so now we don't have a priest? Well, I'm, I'm not sure who... Well, I'll put it like this. I don't know of anyone in the movement who has been anointed as a priest and who has, has gone through all the, the aspects of the antitypical ritual that are necessary in order to do so. And so the priesthood is yet to be restored ultimately. When it is, and when we have the wave sheaf manifested, then we will have the the priestly system in in function. I believe it's on our doorstep. I really do. I think the devil knows it, and I think that's why he's uh, turning up the heat. Absolutely, and actually, everything in the message indicates that it's on the doorstep because our Heavenly Family has been showing the things that are necessary to be there. And they've shown that the initial activity necessary in doing this has already begun. So again, I'd cite everyone to Silver Trumpet, Volume 1, Numbers 3 and 4 to get more information on that. But yeah, it's this is what our Heavenly Family is attempting to bring about right now. And I am so excited about it. Like, seriously, I have been more and more happy with what our Heavenly Family has been doing for us and showing us and all the signs of what I see taking place. Like, there's some sad aspects to it, for sure. But I have not been able to um, resist the encouragement that our Heavenly Family is offering. And it is absolutely wonderful. And I, I have to rejoice in the joy that I see in certain people that, you know, I didn't see before. And, yeah, it's absolutely, um, well, it's incredibly encouraging and motivating. And, yeah, I've, I've never been happier. Amen. Trent, when you talk about um, anointed, um, Mm -hmm. anointed, of course, by our Heavenly Family, but is that like a a visible anointing in terms of you you knowing who it is that's anointed? So, ultimately... The manifestation of the priesthood that our Heavenly Family is wanting to be uh, brought about, ultimately that priesthood must be recognized not only by our Heavenly Family, but also by, quote-unquote, the church or the congregation, which of course includes me and and everyone else. Um, So, you know, just like the the Levitical priests were anointed at some point and were, you know, entered into their their priesthood and and all of that, and it was a functioning system, and there were even courses of priests, and it was highly organized, Um, it should be the same among us, where... It's highly organized. There are people who are full-time priests, and it's known, and, you know, it moves forward like that. Yeah, not people just working independently and deciding, oh, I'm a priest, and I'm going to do this and this and this in the name of the branch, and, you know, 
just go off without being sent, right? Absolutely, yeah. There's the laying on of hands and, and all of that um, for designating people for the work of anointed priesthood. Are we talking about also um, the incorporation of the community rule where uh, the candidates would get baptized and having something like two years, well, I guess that's before baptism, uh, the two years to prove themselves? So there are a few elements to this. Um, but this does relate to the community rule. In the community rule, it speaks, like in, in the, the uh, covenant ceremony of the community rule, there are things that are said by the priests, things that are said by the elders, things that are said by the congregation. Well, clearly they're distinguished and each person has a role. There's the system of tens, fifties, hundreds, and thousands. And um, within that, there are priests designated. And so, yeah, that all factors in. In terms of the aspects of, you know, periods of initiation and, and things like that, periods of learning the message and joining the community, those are all aspects that we will get into more as we continue our studies of the community rule, which I'm certainly looking forward to doing because, again, the community rule has as its purpose what our Heavenly Family has given us to do. Like the purpose outlined in the community rule is the purpose that they've given to us. And I'm very grateful for the fact that Teresa now is actually editing the studies that we uh, had last year about the community rule. So those will be uploaded very soon to YouTube. So I'm looking at the time and uh, we have 10 minutes left before our calling card runs out. Um, and I, we've covered some really good things. All the questions have been excellent. and. Um, Obviously, we have much more to cover. We have a new moon, most likely on Monday. We'll be setting a time for that and notifying people and all of that. Um, so we'll see what our Heavenly Family has in store for us then, which I'm not sure what it is yet, but hey, I'm sure it's going to be just what we need. Every time. Every time. Amen. So... That said, I'm thinking that um, we should probably bring the meeting to a close. Um, is there anyone who would like to thank our Heavenly Family? I will. Dear Heavenly Family, we just thank you so much for today and uh, the accomplishments of uh, your truth settling into our minds. We thank you for these questions that you're leading us to ask and Thank you for the truth of the answers, again, that are settling into our minds and causing us to seek and desire more truth. And uh, we just ask that we learn it in a way that we can teach other people and bring more people into your message. And uh, we just thank you for the weather that we've been having and uh, the work that's been able to to be accomplished because of that. Um, we just ask that you give Trent uh, a new message for uh, for the new moon. We just ask that you bless him with that message, that we're worthy to receive it. And uh, we ask for all this in the name of the branch, he and she. Amen. 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 All right, well, Love you all very much. Looking forward to the new moon. Lila Tove. We'll see you all tomorrow night for the social meeting. Lila Tove. Lila Tove. Amen and good night. Good night.